friends, Jen Foxbot here. In this episode of Machine Learning Math Mondays, we are doing Logistic Regression Part 2. Yay! In this episode, we are going to talk about decision boundaries, which are basically a uh, mathematical representation of how we kind of segment or separate the different parts of our data set. So as a refresher, logistic regression helps us to deal with data that is discrete. So let's say we're trying to classify different types of plants. We have specific labels for each of those plants. We're starting with some simple, uh, some simple data sets of binary values or things that come in only ones or twos. Um, or ones or zeros if you are programming counting. Um, so uh, let's say like true or false, or in our example data set, frog or toad. <laughs> um, so we were uh, looking at a different formulation of our hypothesis function, uh, which allows us to use math and code to make predictions on new data. So with logistic regression, our hypothesis function is slightly different. We're using the sigmoid or logistic uh, regression function. Um, so to, as a refresher, we have our hypothesis function, um, which equals G of um, our parameter matrix times our variable X or our variable vector X. Um, and G is the sigmoid function, which equals one over one plus e to the negative z. And so remember, it's a function, so you just take this stuff in the parentheses and put it into your function machine and it goes doo 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 and it spits it out in place of z. So when we plot g of z like so, we get a, this is 0 0.5 or 1 half, we get a thing that looks like this. So there's asymptotes at 0. It crosses the a vertical axis at one half, and there's an asymptote at one. So how do we read this? Well, our hypothesis function is going to spit out a value because of the sigmoid function between zero and one. So we interpret this as the probability that y equals one given a particular input value x. So remember our parameters are set by the training data. And our variable x, or our vector variable x, is what is going to change with new data. And so each of x is going to give us a value between 0 and 1, which we translate as a probability. So let's say that we um, predict that y equals 1 if h of our hypothesis function is greater than 50% or 0 0.5 in decimal form. Um, and we say y equals 0 if our hypothesis function is less than 50%. This seems reasonable, right? This is kind of how we're taught how to round up numbers. Uh, like, for example, if I have 0 0.56, I can round that up to 0 0.6. If I have 0 0.54, I round that up to uh, 0. Point, or I round that down, sorry, to 0. 0.5. Um, so 5 is the threshold number here. I guess I should have done an example with 5, but I hope that helps. Um, and so this kind of makes sense. If we are predicting a probability that's greater than 50%, we're going to say our prediction is that y equals 1. And if we have a prediction that is less than 50%, we're going to say that y equals 0. Okay. So when does this happen? When does our hypothesis function equal 0 0.5? Um, so we look at our plot for that. Yay, pictures! Um, so uh, our sigmoid function, g of z, um, is greater than 0 0.5 when z equals... Hey, look at the picture, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, when z equals zero, woo! So when we have z equals zero, we have our sigmoid function is equal to 0 0.5. Okay, cool. So then we know um, doo -doo -doo, that h, our hypothesis function of x equals uh, 
it has the this form here um, our parameter uh, matrix times our variable vector um, this is going to be greater than uh, 50 percent when our uh, stuff in the middle our parameter matrix times our variable is greater than or equal to zero da, 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 da. okay so then this is all to say that y equals one when our parameter matrix times our variable is greater than or equal to zero and y equals zero i'm gonna be lazy so we're just gonna say do that for this, bring it down um, when it is less than zero okay so this is the general format um but sometimes your data has some funky decision boundary and uh we are going to need to use a different form for the hypothesis function. We're still going to use the sigmoid function, critical in logistic regression, because it's, you know, kind of named after the sigmoid or logistic regression function. Um, but we're going to need to um, spec out what our parameter matrix and our variable vector look like, which is super cool because we can actually have a, uh, a line or a polynomial function inside of the sigmoid function, which allows us to do some sneaky and, and tricky stuff with math. Okay, so let's look at a specific example. Um, let's say we have a data set. Let's say we want to go swimming this summer, and we want to we want to find a river to swim in that is safe. And so we plot um, the river speed and uh, the river temperature of, <laughs> does that work? We're gonna plot the river speed and the river size. How about that? Um, on uh, our uh, <laughs> on our graph here, where we have x1 and x2, uh, it doesn't really matter which is which, but I just, I like to put real examples uh, to these types of things because I think it helps it stick. So let's say that we take a bunch of measurements of rivers. I'm going to get some uh, more data points over here. So the red X's are the don't swim in these rivers and the blue X's or the blue O's <laughs> are the, yeah, we can swim in these rivers. And maybe we know that these rivers are safe to swim in because um, other people that we know swim in them, or the Coast Guard says it's safe to swim in them, or some other uh, person of authority that we can trust says it is safe to swim in them, and we gather a data set like so. Um, and so we come and we say, hey, okay, I can see that we have a decision boundary. Whoopsies, I kind of drew that a little bit off. Um, it should be slightly over this way. Oh, shoot. Okay, I'll try to redraw that. Nah. Okay, 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 here we go. There we go. Okay, we can fix our little, <laughs> our measurement circle. Sorry, buddy. This is what happens when you use chuck and not a computer. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so we have our decision boundary. And so then based on our measurements, uh, for funsies, let's say that this intersects at three and three. Um, again, I'm being very fast and loose uh, with my units here because it's just an example. Um, but uh, this tells us that our data set needs a linear decision boundary. And so we can go and say, okay, we need a, a, a format of our hypothesis function that uh, can give us a linear, uh, a linear decision boundary. So something that looks like this, where we have, um, actually, we're gonna move this over because I'm gonna totally run out of space. So our hypothesis function is going to still be of the sigmoid function, but we are going to input theta naught plus theta one x one plus theta two x two. Oh, boom, perfect amount of space, nice. Okay, so in this case, we have three parameters and let's say we run our algorithm um, and it spits out a parameter matrix of negative three, one, and one. And then we uh, shove that back into um, 
our hypothesis, well, what we did previously to figure out uh, where um, our hypothesis function is going to be greater than or equal to 0 0.5, because that's our decision boundary. Um, and so uh, basically, in other words, we're going to predict y equals 1 when, uh, and then we input these found values for our parameter matrix into uh, this part. Um, so when negative 3 plus 1 times x1 plus 1 times x2 is greater than or equal to 0, then we can solve and simplify a little bit. So x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to 3. Hey, that's the equation of a line! And if we wanted to find the um, exact decision boundary, we would set this equal to 0. Um, so db is when x1 plus x2 equals 3. And so then we could say, okay, well, if I want to solve for x2, then I could say when x2 equals 3 minus x1. Um, so that tells us that, hey, this is the slope of a line. Um, well, the slope is negative 1, so it goes this way. Look at that. And it intersects at the um, vertical axis at positive 3, and it has a slope of 1, so uh, rise over 1 of 1. Rise over run of 1. That <laughs> rhymes. It's also a little hard to say. Cool. Okay. Um, so uh, any values that are um, below this line tell us that the river is safe to swim in, and any measurements above this line tell us that river is not so safe to swim in, and we probably should avoid it. Um, in this case, I might err on the side of caution and say if it is, if you are getting a prediction of 50%, maybe you would round down. Um, but that's the great and fun thing of being able to build these types of systems for ourselves is that we can use our best judgment um, to make those kinds of decisions. Okay, so that's how we deal with a linear decision boundary, but sometimes we have nonlinear decision boundaries. What? this is wild okay so it's wild but we can totally handle it yes we can because we are smart cookies okay so <laughs> let's say I have a plot um, oh wait I'm gonna move it up okay let's say I have a plot that looks like this let's say I am an astrophysicist or astrobiologist so cool and I want to figure out if certain planets might have life on them. So I make a bunch of observations, I take a bunch of existing data, and I start to make some plots. Um, maybe we have size of the planet as one of our variables and distance from its star on the other. And I find that the habitable planets have uh, I, I mark them on my plot with green circles, and I mark the non-habitable planets with red X's again. So this time we're going to use the holiday colors, I suppose. Um, so it goes, red and green will forever be, in my mind, associated with Christmas. Here we are. That's fine. They do look nice together. And it also makes sense, because planet Earth, places where humans live are green. Okay. So justifying my choice of colors, and sometimes it's just because I want them to look pretty. Okay, so let's say we get a bunch of data that looks like this. One more X because I feel like it. Um, so in this case, us humans, we're smart, right? And we can say like, hey, look, our data has a circular decision boundary. So then I can be the smart astrophysicist that I am and say, I want to be a little bit lazy and I don't want to have to plot all of the measurements to determine if a planet is potentially hospitable to life or not. I want to be able to write an algorithm, give uh, my algorithm some data, and have it predict for me whether or not that planet is likely to be hospitable to life. But in this case, we have a nonlinear decision boundary, so we need a higher order polynomial in our hypothesis function. So something that looks like this. Our hypothesis function is going to be, again, sigmoid. So we're going to have, we always have to have our um, initial parameter, theta naught. And then we're, we still only have two variables. So theta 1 times x1 
plus theta 2 times x2 plus theta 3 times x1 squared, higher order polynomial with two variables, plus theta 4 of x2 uh, squared. There we go. Okay, and so then we do the same thing we did with the linear example. Um, we uh, plug our training set into our algorithm and it gives us a, it does its, um, uh, wow, I'm totally spacing. It, <laughs> uh, it uh, works on the training set with um, gradient descent. Wow, thank you. I have decision boundaries stuck in my head as like, no, it's another two, two word phrase. It does gradient descent and it gives us the best fit uh, for our training data. And let's say it gives us a parameter matrix of negative one, zero, zero, one, and one. So we plug that back into our hypothesis function, this shenanigansies. And so we get uh, uh, negative one, um, well, one. So then we know that y equals one when uh, negative one, these two uh, parts cancel. And we are left with x1 squared plus x2 squared. And this equals one when we have uh, this part greater than zero. And again, we can solve for our actual decision boundary. Um, and so when x1 squared plus x2 squared is greater than or equal to one, uh, then we have y equals uh, one. Wait, I guess I could say, yeah, okay. So, um, we also could uh, flip this. So if we wanted to say, if we wanted to uh, say that y equals one outside of the circle, um, yeah, now I'm getting lost in my train of thought. Anyway, but the, the point is to keep track of what zero and one means. So in this case, um, one means not hospitable and, and zero means hospitable. Here we are, um, but you could flip it if you wanted to. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so here we go. I was like, I'm missing something. I need to just explain something. It's important. So the important thing to keep in mind is that the decision boundary is a property of the hypothesis function and the parameters theta. The training set is used to fit the parameters, but it does not determine the decision boundary. OK, um, so what you need to do when you are building a linear regression hypothesis function is to pick a, um, a hypothesis function that can appropriately give you um, the right decision boundary. So you might need to use higher order polynomials um, depending on what your data set looks like, because that is something that uh, the machine learning algorithm cannot do for you. Okay, um, so that's where I'm going to leave it. Uh, so I hope that that was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions on logistic regression or uh, decision boundaries. I may do a quick episode on um, just like a very general recap of logistic regression. And then we're going to move on as I look into my notes. Oh, we're going to keep going on logistic regression because we got to do the cost function. <laughs> there we go. So there is going to be a part three. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much for watching, friends, and we'll see you next time. Bye.